Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Sunday episode, and this is going to be part one of two, and it's all going to be about Gentiles, though I believe each of these individual episodes will be able to stand just fine on their own. So let me explain what I'm thinking and why I want to talk about this, and then we'll get right into it. So I want to talk about Gentiles. I want to talk about the separation of the Gentiles from the Jewish people and from the Jewish God. I want to build and share my case here that it is ridiculous and absurd that we think this God is all loving, yet alone inclusive of of his non-chosen people group, even the very fact that he has a people group that he protects, that he leads, that he reveals himself to, should have been our very first hint that something is amiss. We skip over verse after verse after verse after verse that both Yahweh and Jesus make it very clear that we, the Gentile, do not have a right to him, are not protected by him, are not granted or guaranteed anything. And I hear all the excuses coming already. That's why we're going to have a part two. Part two is to deal Deal with what those excuses are, which are, Brandon, you don't understand. After Jesus's death, the Gentiles were able to be grafted in through faith alone. Haven't you read anything that Paul has written? I have indeed. And it is that very issue that Paul, through his own personal revelation of Jesus, got a version of Christianity that is not consistent with what Jesus preached, what Peter and James taught, etc. It's its own thing, and it completely conflicts. So we'll be doing a Paul versus Jesus or Paul versus James and Peter or Paulanity versus Christianity video, that will be part two. But if you take those epistles out of it and the lovey-dovey fairy tale that has just kind of been cast out there that God loves everyone, even though we have an abundance of evidence that suggests that is entirely not true, I think what we're left with for about 85% of the Bible is a very clear depiction that this God that modern day Christians worship, even if they're Gentiles, especially if they're Gentiles, just so happens to be a God that does not care about them, recognize them, and made them just to hate them. A huge shout out really quick to a commenter by the name of Nezor. This person has been incredibly helpful. Anytime I've made mention to this in other videos, they have commented with a few supporting verses. And I said, it looks like you've looked into this a lot. Can you send me all of your research? And they did. And I'm going to be utilizing quite a bit of the verses from that email as we go through this. So thank you so much for your participation in this Nezor. Now, we wouldn't be talking about the Bible if we didn't have some contradictions. So to be fair, I'm going to read the verses in the Old Testament that are pro gender However, I should note that they're here and they get buried immediately and very quickly by all the other verses. But just to be fair, Exodus 22, 21, you shall not mistreat a sojourner or oppress him for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. That exact statement is repeated in both Exodus 23, 9 and Leviticus 19, 33. In Leviticus 23, 22, we see when you reap the harvest of your land, moreover, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field. You are to leave them for the afflicted and the sojourner. That's that's nice, right? That's a good Levitical law. I could argue that they're just making sure they can keep these people around to be working the land that they're going to eventually conquer and take and then genocide these people, but fine. We'll just assume this is good intention. And the only other one that I could find was Ezekiel 47, 22 through 23, and it will be that you shall divide it by lot for an inheritance among yourselves and among the sojourners who sojourn in your midst, who bring forth sons in your midst, and they shall be to you as the native born among the sons of Israel. Now there is actually contention with this verse that it is talking about Israelites that have been kind of outcast and coming back in and they're having sons and they're getting remade apart. Like none of this, all these sojourner things are a little bit vague, but it's definitely possible it could be talking about Gentiles. I'd also love to point out that the only considerations here are also for the men or the sons born. A Gentile woman was as worthless as one could be essentially. Now, just for the sake of novelty, I am not going to utilize all the verses where we see God sending his chosen people group around genociding and mass murdering every single other group and tribe around them. That would be redundant. Yes, it's a form of genocide. Yes, it's a form of ethnic cleansing. Yes, it is a separation because of where and to whom you were born. Yes, it is a clear indicator that God has a chosen people group and that he is only winning battles and victories and doing miracles on behalf of this one particular group. Wouldn't it have been amazing if in the Bible we heard about the lands to the east like China, or that even though the Israelite people didn't know 
about it. Their God told them that across the oceans, there was land of natives that were being taken care of by God. Like it is so centric to what these people knew about the world at their time. And within all of the people that these people knew about, the Bible is saying, here's our chosen people group and everyone else around is either an afterthought or an enemy. So with those out of the way and understanding that that is 100% the case, but it would be beating a dead horse, let me read you some of the verses from both the Old and New Testament that help us understand how God feels about the Gentile. Isaiah 60, 16, you will also suck the milk of nations and suck the breast of kings. Then you will know that I, Yahweh, am your savior and your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. In Deut 11, 23 through 25, then Yahweh will dispossess all the nations from before you, and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. No man will be able to stand before you. Yahweh your God will put the dread of you and the fear of you on the land on which you set foot. So Yahweh is essentially saying, hey, here's all the property I'm going to give you. Yes, it's inherited by other people right now. Yes, they are people, but they're not you. They're not my chosen people. I'll strike them with dread and fear because I will do the things necessary for you to dispossess them. Psalms 47.3 is quite simple. He subdues people under us and nations under our feet. Going back to Duke 14.21, you shall not eat anything which dies of itself. You may give it to the sojourner who is within your gate so that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a holy people to Yahweh your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. There's two things here. I mean, first we have, hey, you know what? Like send the roadkill away. In fact, don't just give it away, sell it to the sojourner, right? Might as well get something out of this. But you, my people are too holy for this. This is just absolute racism, by the way. Within this same group of stories, when the Jewish people talked about how oppressed they are, one would be forgiven for thinking, maybe it's because you went around telling everyone that they were worthless, that they weren't holy, that they didn't belong to your God, and that whatever was theirs would be yours by force. Just a thought. I feel the need for the caveat that none of this is true. This is a man-made myth by a group of people that at one time, whether they believed this or not, wrote it down. I mentioned in my last secular Bible study series on Esther that most of the Old Testament up to this point is just Jewish propaganda. So please understand the lens with which we are looking at this. Let's do some more verses from the Old Testament. In Deut 23, 20, you may charge interest to a foreigner, but to your brother, you shall not charge interest so that Yahweh, your God may bless you in all that you send forth your hand to do in the land, which you are about to enter to possess. So yeah, take advantage of them, give them interest, make bad deals, suck them dry. Going back to to chapter 7 verse 22 and Yahweh your God will clear away these nations before you little by little you will not be able to put an end to them quickly lest the wild beast become too numerous for you but Yahweh your God will give them over before you and will throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed and he will give their kings into your hands so that you will make their name perish from under heaven no man will be able to stand before you until you have destroyed them so we have Yahweh himself speaking here, calling us, the Gentiles, wild beasts. What stuck out to me the most in this verse, so that you will make their name perish from under heaven. Does this sound like a God of inclusivity? Does this sound like a God who cares about anyone other than the Israelites? No. No, you cannot read the Old Testament and believe that God cares about you unless you are of Jewish descent. You cannot. It is false to do so. Well, good thing we have the New Testament then. Yeah, but shouldn't you see if it matches up? Shouldn't we consider the immutability of God? Again, go back to my video where I list the 20 things that are so clearly objectively wrong according to the Bible that Yahweh himself does. Doesn't the character of this God matter? Shouldn't what he speaks matter? I always think it is so funny. We are told that these Christians love their God, desire to draw close and know the desires of his heart, that his will be done. He's screaming his will verse after verse after verse, and you don't care. Then Paul claims he has a vision, this wild trip on the road to Damascus, says some pretty things about how you too can now be special to God, and you fall all over it. That's what gets preached every Sunday. Why? Because it's nicer, because it's better. And it is also the antithesis, the exact opposite of what Yahweh himself is saying. You either believe this Bible is the inspired word of God and accurate, or you don't. If you can't believe what God says, he says, 
What can you believe? I'm not giving you the interpretations of prophets. Most of what we are reading here is very simple from the mouth of God himself. Going back to chapter 2, verse 25, this day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the peoples everywhere under the heavens, who when they hear the report of you will tremble and be in anguish because of you. Everywhere under heaven, right? The context of this verse is a battle with the Ammonites, but God's not stopping there. He's saying it's the beginning. Going back to the verse before, little by little, I will give it all to you. What's funny is the plans of God didn't work out in the long term, just like the plans of Jesus didn't work out. Jesus was saying the world is about to end. That's why all his bad advice makes sense in that time frame and in that setting. Leave your family. Who cares? The end could be tomorrow. Many of you won't taste death. No need to store up for yourself treasures here. Think about tomorrow in heaven. Both these gods failed, and then we had to rely on reinterpretations by future people like Paul on what it really meant. The fact we cannot take God and his son at their word because it failed and we have to make excuses for it should be very telling. Let's go to the most damning verse in the entire Bible, in my opinion, Leviticus 25, 44 through 46. You're all probably sick of me talking about it, and yet in every single video that I bring it up, I get comments where people are like, you don't understand God's against slavery. As for your male and female slaves, whom you may have, and this is God speaking, right? It is this simple. God just said you may have male and female slaves. But I thought he also said you couldn't have slaves. You're right. The Israelites could not own Israelite slaves. They could not kidnap Israelites. They could have indentured servitude, and it was awful. But this is talking about chattel slavery. Let's be so clear. As for your male and female slaves, whom you may have, you may acquire male and female slaves from the nations that are around you. Not the nation within you, because those are other Israelites, and we have our own rules for that, but from the nations around you. This is no different than the Americans going to Africa for their slaves. We were just better at going to further neighbors. We had big boats. And also, you may acquire from the sons of the foreign residents who sojourn among you, from them and their families who are with you. As for those whom they have begotten in your land, they also may become your possession. You may even give them as an inheritance to your sons after you to receive as a possession. You can use them as permanent slaves. But in respect to your brothers, the sons of Israel, you shall not have dominion over one another with brutality. You can have dominion over each other, indentured servitude, but not too brutal. And even the word brutality here is like a caveat that is ridiculous because when you read further about what you can do to your Israelite servants, you can get away with a whole heck of a lot. This isn't a video on slavery, but if you have a God who says, I have one chosen holy people group and only for this group of people will I allow them to make slaves of any other neighboring nation, just not their own, what are you forced to come to terms with? This is a God of one people and it is not us. Gentile is the catch-all term for anyone that is not an Israelite. Case closed. So simple. We could go on and on and on and on with the slavery laws to show you just how little God thinks of anyone else, to treat them as possessions, to pass them down as inheritance. This does not get any more clear. I digress. Isaiah 61, 5 through 6, strangers will stand and pasture your flocks, and foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers, but you will be called the priest of Yahweh. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations, and in their glories you will boast. Seems pretty simple. Seems honestly like God created non-Israelites, like he could have just made only chosen people, right? Or better yet, he could have made everyone and made them all chosen people. But instead he made a small group of chosen people, but still chose to make other people. And it seems like they are just there to be barely kept alive for resources. That's it. I'm not sure how many more of these we need to do. We are going to jump to New Testament verses in just a second, but let me give you a couple more. Going to chapter 60, verse 12, just really quick. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish, and the nations will surely be laid waste. Again, just here to serve. In Isaiah 49, 23, kings will be your guardians and their princesses your nurses. They will bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick the dust of your feet, and you will know that I am Yahweh. This is about humiliating other nations, even their greatest will just become your guardians and your nurses, the rest of them your slaves. By the way, that last part, and you will know that I am Yahweh, that's a God boasting about you'll know how great my power is because you as my chosen people will be supreme among all other people. That's how God gets his value is by providing for his people group. Do you think he's providing for the people who are licking the dust off the feet of the Israelites? 
No. While I'm going through all this, I hope you're thinking in the back of your head, well, then how does this work for the New Testament? How does this work when we get to an all-loving God, a compassionate Jesus, my best friend and personal savior? It doesn't work. It's a completely separate religion that was built on top and extracted from the ruins. It's been forced and manipulated to no end to get it to be so contrived and contorted that it fits this very narrow thing that only works if you really don't look at it too closely. Let me speed up through the rest of the Old Testament ones here. Jeremiah 1 10. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to cause to perish and to pull down. This is divine right to go and conquer anyone that is not not like you. Jeremiah 46, 28, Jacob, my servant, do not fear, declares Yahweh, for I am with you. I will make a complete destruction of all the nations where I've banished you, yet I will not make a complete destruction of you. Jeremiah 51 is not so great. Verse 20, he says, you are my instrument of shattering my weapon of war, and with you I shatter nations, and with you I destroy kingdoms. With you I shatter the man and the woman, the old and the young, the choice man and virgin, the shepherd and his flock, the farmer and his his oxen, the governors, and prefects. I'm not saying that it's all gravy to be an Israelite. Here's something that you need to really understand. This God, in the pantheon of gods that he came from, from Canaan, was a storm god a war god. If a war god is going to have a favorite people, what's he going to do with them? He's going to make them the strongest soldiers. He's going to make them conquerors. That's how you know that he is Yahweh. This is like when Athena plucks out a few Greeks and says, you will do my bidding. War is her game. And those are the people that will serve her and extend her name. It's very simple. This is just old cult mythology. Let me do two last verses from the Old Testament. We will move on. Daniel 2.44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will cause a kingdom to rise up which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself stand forever. The context here is the dream that Daniel interprets, and it is essentially saying we will have one nation in the end. It will be the Israelite nation, and all the Gentiles will perish. And just for fun, one more, Psalm 2, 8 through 9, ask of me, and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance, and the ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall shatter them like a potter's vessel. This is God's gift. Like this is the positive spin. This is God's gift to his chosen people the world, the people of the world, their possessions and their cities are now your possessions and your playthings. Enjoy. It's disgusting. And Jesus was his father's son. So let's see how that goes. Matthew 15, 21 through 28. This one's a bit longer, but it's very interesting. And going away from there, Jesus withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples disciples came and were pleading with him saying, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. So you've got a Jewish leader and his Jewish followers completely ignoring and being annoyed by a Canaanite woman, a Gentile, whose daughter is demon possessed. Now again, I don't believe in demon possession. And if the story had any shred of truth, I'm sure it was some horrible mental illness. But within the confines of the text, we can just go ahead and imagine that God had no problem letting demons run rampant amongst all of these Gentiles. Jesus answered and said, I was not sent except to those lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is something I think does not get enough attention. And this is what Jesus says himself, not sent to save the whole world. Sent for whom? Just to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm going to split up this verse, forgive me, but a lot of people like to point to the Good Samaritan parable as Jesus showing that he is actually inclusive of all people and not just the lost sheep. No, the Samaritans are the perfect example of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go look it up yourself. The Samaritans were long lost Jews. Jews. It's the story about a Levite, which should have done better, but he passed by, and even someone as low as a Samaritan, still a Jew, came and did the right thing. It is not about loving your neighbor no matter where they are from. Context, people. Isn't that what is so important here? Let me finish reading the verse. I can't believe I've interrupted myself so much. I apologize. This woman persists, but she came and was bowing down before him saying, Lord, help me. Okay, this is try number three. And he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. How much more clear do you need it that Jesus didn't come for you? This woman is a dog to him. Luckily, she's clever enough to say, yes, Lord, right? An agreement that she understands this. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. So then Jesus gives in and says, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as your wish. Your daughter is healed. Literally takes nothing, not even a wave of his hand, just the words out of his mouth. And yet the first three times he is pressed to do so, he is unwilling. First, he ignores her. Then he says, 
says he's not here for her. He states he's only here for Israel. Then he says that his powers would be wasted on someone like her, as she is as lowly as a dog. And if you think that's metaphorical language, remember you can pass down Gentiles as true possessions. I would say possessions are even lower to people than dogs are. This was Jesus probably being generous. And she's saying, yeah, but dogs still get a crumb. Fine, I threw you a crumb. This is your loving personal savior and best friend right here in the New Testament, right here from the words of Jesus himself, right here, not in a parable, not in a metaphor, a documented account of who this man was and what he thought. We could stop there and my point would be well made, but let's do Romans 11, 11. I say then, did they stumble so as to fall? May it never be, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Even amidst all of the ridiculousness of Paul's inclusivity of the Gentiles, when pressed about the reason for it, it was simply because the Jews were not heeding the stern warnings enough. And so, on an afterthought, I will accept Gentiles, come to me, be saved, receive righteousness, receive salvation, so that the chosen people group could be jealous and come back. I put before you that this is no different than a husband who is not getting the attention he wants from his wife, so he has sex with another woman in front of her. A woman who she despises, who they had both previously said was not worthy of him, so that his wife would come groveling back. This is disgusting. So, even if we believe Paul and we get past all the contradictions about why his particular form of salvation doesn't work and how this was never meant for the Gentiles because even Jesus himself himself said he is here just for Israel, understand that if we could make exceptions for all that, which I do not believe we can, we are simply here as God's abusive chess piece against his actual chosen people. Man alive. I really believe those two verses are enough. You kind of choose your own adventure story here. Go with what Jesus said and believe you are not part of this, or go with what Paul said and believe you are only a part of it as a sick gesture. If this is the God you want to serve, if this is a righteous, all-loving, all-benevolent God, and you can say that with a straight face after hearing just these verses, I mean, there's there's so many more. The stories are endless. The genocides are endless. The name-calling is endless. The putting down is endless. The enslavement is endless. The rape is endless. God barely treats the Israelites well. In fact, it's horrific the things he does to them and has them do to others. Others, but it's nothing in comparison to the Gentiles. Now, if you want to stop here, you've heard my spiel, but I want to give you a broader example from Genesis about kind of God's initial plan. This is going to be about the story of Joseph. Joseph, you know, the coat of many colors. He gets abandoned by his brothers, sold into slavery in Egypt, where he works his way up the ranks, like always happens in these stories. Now he's in charge of preparing for the vision he's had of the famine to come. And I'm not going to read you all these verses. They can be found in Genesis 41 and also Genesis 47 for the most part. But he tricks the Gentiles, the Egyptians, the non-Jewish people, and he goes out and he steals all their food. And then he sells it back to them during the famine so that he takes all their money. So now they have no money. And then they also ran out of the food that he sold back to them that was their own food. And now as they're starving to death, he says, fine, give me your possessions. Give me your livestock. Give me your land. So he takes everything from them. Now this is divine providence here. This is God orchestrating through Joseph, through a member of his chosen people. And then what does Joseph do for the chosen people? I'll read you a couple of these verses. They're shorter than that whole tale. In Genesis 45, 18, and take your father and your households and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. In Genesis 47, 6, the land of Egypt is at your disposal. Have your father and your brothers settle in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. So here the land is at their disposal. They are now officially allowed to settle in this land that has been stolen and tricked and deceived away from its original inhabitants. In Genesis 47, 27, it says, now Israel lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen, and they took possession of property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. Now, the rest here would be an assertion by me, but it's very interesting that right before we have 430 years of slavery in Egypt, we have the Israelite people tricking the Egyptians out of their land and as foreigners invading and taking over all of their best things and growing to a very large population. Then there's this milky area and then all of a sudden they've been in captivity. I wonder if one has to do with the other. And did they learn their lesson in captivity? No, nope, that was just God's punishment for disobedience. And as soon as he brought them out of that, he immediately turned around and said, go ahead and go get all your slaves. Make sure they're from other nations though. We got to build this people group back up. You guys are my guys. 
you guys are going to be holy because of me. You are going to prove who I am. I am Yahweh. And just like we tricked and deceived and conquered to get this land in Egypt, we are going to go do that all over the rest of this area. And then you can go back to all the original Old Testament verses that I read at the beginning of this video. This is who God is. This is what he thinks about his chosen people. And this is what he thinks about the Gentiles. So I will shut up, I promise. But if you are a Gentile and you believe that God has a plan for you, I'd ask from what context and where in the Bible. If you believe that God is a good God, a gracious God who cares about his creation, point me to the verse. If you believe this God has a desire for everyone to come to know him, to have a personal relationship with him for any other means than not enacting jealousy on his original people group, as Paul states for us, show me where and why you believe that. Now, I'm admitting, just like the first verses that I started with, sometimes God has said some things about foreigners. I think if you look at all of the context though, right? Selling them the roadkill, letting them eat the back part of the field, just keeps them alive as a workforce. I think that that's pretty well explained. And I think that some of the things we might see in the New Testament, like the Great Commission, going and telling all the world and making disciples of all nations, though completely contradicting with this idea that Jesus only cares and only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel can also be answered in a similar fashion. Maybe God in the Great Commission is talking to the people to go and find these lost sheep that are all spread out. We see in the Psalms going and hunting down and looking over the cliffs and the ravines and the valleys for that one sheep that got itself stuck and separated from the flock. It sounds like Jesus is telling them to go call back all those lost sheep. You could make a case for either you could make a case that Jesus changed his mind in the Great Commission is to go out and save the whole world. Fine. Then we have a contradiction. Your best case scenario, if you honestly believe from whatever verses you cherry pick that God loves the whole world and truly has a plan for everyone and wants everyone to be saved, is at best a contradiction. Now, I didn't even get to all the parts of the world that were completely unreached by this God. As you know, my favorite example is the Native Americans. Zero contact. We know there were people over here during this time, and for century after century after century, really millennia after millennia, they went un touched. They weren't even on God's radar. This is true for the people in Australia. This is true for most of the rest of the East. This is true for most of Africa. This is true for most of Northern Europe. For thousands of years, this was concentrated as a religion among the ancient Near East. And it wasn't until humans, not God, progressed enough in travel and technology and things of this nature that the message spread, usually at the tip of the sword, by the way. None of this sounds like a goal of a God that no he even created all these people and cares about them at all. The funnest thing to think about is the probability of life existing in other parts of this universe. If you think the Bible is specific to just the Middle East, oh my gosh, even when it zooms out, it zooms out to just the earth, right? The future heaven is actually going to be mixed with our current earth. What a small understanding of the cosmos. If you were betting, you would bet that there are billions of other life forms out there. And then you zoom into just the earth and then on the earth, you zoom into just the Israel. And that is what this amazing, huge God of creation, the universe, totality, and time cares about. I can see past it. It's a local myth for a local people. That's it. I hope you can see past it as well. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful day. I will see you on Tuesday with another takedown. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top three tiers of support. First is the Iconoclast tier with GVI Precision Body and Paint, Jason Rollins, Oliver, and Sean Skaggs. Also my Atheist Advocate tier, Elijah Jeffrey, Jared Nichols, Christy Goff, and Sparky. And lastly, a huge shout out to all of my Secular Scholar tier patrons. If you like what I'm doing on this channel or you believe in my mission, please consider supporting as well. Thanks and have a wonderful day.